Hey everybody, it is Dak here from the Ed Boys, and welcome to my Duke guide. The Duke Sucalus is one of the Desert Treasure 2 bosses, probably the easiest of these bosses to kill overall. Uh, in this guide, I'm going to go over the requirements and recommended stats for fighting the Duke, then we'll go over the gear and the inventory setup that you'll bring with you. After that, we'll talk about how to travel there, and then actually getting into the fight. And then finally, we're going to go over the potential loot that you can get from the Duke. If you have been enjoying these videos or just getting some useful information out of them, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. I do also stream on Twitch, which should be linked on the screen and in the description. Thank you very much for the support, everybody. First of all, you will need to complete Desert Treasure 2 to be able to grind out Duke kills, though you do have to kill him one time during the quest, and the mechanics are going to be the same whether you're in the quest or after it, though the boss during the quest has like lower stats and whatnot. I suggest having 80 plus in each of your melee stats, attack, strength, and defense. A small portion of the Duke fight is just running around the room and making potions, which means if you have worse gear or stats, it's not actually quite as detrimental, because overall he has low health. That being said, pushing 90 plus attack and strength before grinding out kills would be very nice for DPS. Also, having a higher level in herb lore and mining can be helpful, so if you get 80 mining and 80 herb lore, the potion phase is going to be a little bit faster, though this is not a requirement by any means. You will need all of your protection prayers, so 43 prayer is required. I highly suggest having 70 prayer and piety unlocked too, though. Piety makes a massive difference for your melee DPS, so it is very worth it. Now let's go ahead and get to the gear section of the guide. The Duke is weak to Slash, so you will be using a melee setup. In this section, I'm going to go over each gear slot, showing each option that is available, from best in slot down to the lowest option that I would go for. For the helmet, if you happen to be on a Duke task, then you want to use the Slayer Helm. Uh, the next three helms usually go Torva, Helm of Nata's Knot, and Serpentine Helm. The Torva Helm actually has three more strength than the Serpentine Helmet, and usually it's every four strength levels that you get a max hit. This does depend on exactly your strength level and your overall gear setup. So if you don't get a max hit out of wearing the Torva Helmet, then it's actually going to be better for you to be wearing the Serpentine Helm, because the Serpentine Helm will help you poison the Duke, doing a little bit extra damage. It is worth checking a DPS calculator to see if you will get a max hit or not, when buying an upgrade, or if you already have both items and you're trying to test it, you can set up a dummy in your house and just attack it with both setups to see where you do or don't get a max hit. I do have a DPS calc that is linked in the description that should be able to help you out if you're trying to learn more on that. And then after all of that, you have the Helm of Nata's Knot, which is still a solid option. But overall, if you're getting through Desert Treasure 2 life, the Serpentine Helm should be available and is actually a very good helmet here. In your cape slot, you have the Infernal Cape as best in slot, followed by the Fire Cape. If you don't have the Fire Cape yet, you should go for a Mythical Cape, which does require Dragon Slayer 2, or the best Arduin Cloak that you have. But if you're working on Desert Treasure 2, you definitely are ready for that Fire Cape. The best in slot necklace is an amulet of torture. The torture has two more strength and five more accuracy over a fury or a blood fury, so generally it's going to be better DPS. The blood fury is very helpful though. It's, it's very close in DPS and it has a passive healing effect that makes a big difference in your trip length. This does require recharging the blood fury with blood shards occasionally, which is another reason that the torture is nice, so you don't have to deal with that, but I do like the blood fury a lot for this fight. The amulet of fury has the same stats as a blood fury, but without the healing, and in worst case scenario, you could go for a glory, but if you're rocking Desert Treasure 2 gains, you probably should be able to get your hands on a Fury at this point. In the ammo slot, you can go for a Blessing. The Rada's Blessing 4 is best in slot with a plus 2 prayer bonus, and then any other Blessing is a plus 1 bonus. The Duke is weak to Slash, and he's a very large monster, so the best in slot weapon here is the Scythe of Vitur. The Scythe is pretty expensive to use, to be fair, so the Soul Reaper's Axe is actually a close second, and then after that you have the Asmumpton's Fang. The Arc Light does very solid damage on the Duke, but it is a 4 tick weapon, which kind of makes it a little bit more of a pain to use than some of the 5 tick weapons, so I do prefer the Fang over the Arc Light, but don't don't forget if you're using a fang, you do want to set that fang to slash instead of stab. From there you could go for the blade of Sailador, and then the abyssal tentacle would still be really solid. Even a regular whip could get you some kills, but overall setting your sights for that as Mumpton Fang is very good. In the shield slot, the Avernic Defender is best in slot. Uh, the Avernic is a good upgrade, but it's pretty expensive, and the Dragon Defender is still very solid. After that, you could go for Dragonfire Shield or Obsidian Shield. Again, though, if you're up to Desert Treasure 2 gains, you probably can manage that Dragon Defender. For your chest and leg slot, Torva is best in slot, though it is very expensive. Bandos is still very good, and then after that, you could combine like a Fighter Torso and some Obsidian Legs. If you have none of those options, then you could use Barrow's gear to tank a little bit, like Torags or Guthans, and then the cheapest gear I would go for is Proselyte to get a little bit of prayer boost. The Ferocious Gloves are best in slot for melee. They're a good upgrade for their price, but they also require Dragon Slayer 2 to wear them. Uh, the Barrow's Gloves are a great second best in slot, since they still have a good strength bonus, and then after that, you could go down the list of Recipe for Disaster Gloves gloves, you have dragon gloves, rune gloves, or the regen bracelet. The regen bracelet has the same stats as adamant gloves, but it doubles the rate that you naturally heal hit points for a small boost in health. 
Best in slot boots are the primordial boots. They're not a very big upgrade over dragon boots and they're very expensive. So dragon boots are just fine. Guardian boots can be solid for some good defensive stats. And then after that, you would go with rune boots. And if you're an iron man who hasn't been able to pick up any of these, climbing boots do have a strength bonus on them, which is kind of nice. And finally, in the ring slot, the Bellator ring is very good here. The Duke is weak to slash, and that Bellator ring has a plus 6 strength bonus along with a plus 20 slash bonus, which is solid. The Light Bearer is also very good for getting extra special attacks in there. There's a decent amount of time that you make potions instead of actually fighting the boss, and this means that you could wear the Light Bearer during that time and still boost your special attack energy, uh, whereas the offensive ring won't do anything while you're making the potions. So there's actually a, a bit of an option for a ring switch, but we'll be going over that in the inventory section of the guide. After those, you have the Ultor ring. This ring is very good for DPS, but the Bellator is a little bit better for slash weapons. Uh, the Berserker ring is very good too, and also the Imbued Warriors ring is a great option, and it's very cheap. The Berserker Ring and the Warrior Ring imbued are both right about the same DPS add-on for that slash life. From there, you could go for a Brimstone Ring, and if you don't have any of those options, you could just wear your Ring of Shadows. If you have any questions about the gear setup, be sure to let me know in the comments, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Now let's go over the inventory setup that you can bring with you. First, I have the Bandos God Sword. This is a great spec weapon for speeding up kills. When you land a Bandos God Sword spec, it drops the Duke's defense level by however much damage you did. So if you do a 20, he loses 20 defense levels. He is also weak to slash, so you're going to land Bandos God Sword specs way more often than you'll ever land a Dragon Warhammer spec on him. Uh, other spec weapons that add DPS, like the Void Waker or the Dragon Claws, or even a Dragon Dagger for a budget setup are not that bad, but the Bandos Godsword spec is S tier in here. I bring the Arc Light with me for the Enraged phase. It's a lot simpler just to keep your attacks at like the 4 tick pace once he starts to go at a 4 tick pace. You don't really need it, but it is kind of convenient. The Light Bearer is a nice add-on since you spend so much time running and making potions. It's not usually helpful bringing a ring switch, but the spare time during potions phase gives you a little bit of extra spec energy wearing the Light Bearer, and then it's better to use one of the offensive rings during the fight. In my rune pouch, I have thralls that would be blood runes, cosmic runes, and fire runes. Do not forget your Book of the Dead if you're bringing thralls. Thralls are very good for extra DPS, and you can also squeeze in some death runes in the pouch if you have like the four spot imbued rune pouch, and then take soul runes in the envy, and you could use death charge for even more special attack energy. Uh, I don't really bother with death charge to be fair, because I usually forget that I even have it on me. I use the Ring of Shadows here to get to the Duke, and then the House Teleport for leaving. You could replace the House Teleports with like a Ring of Dueling for an easy bank teleport. And then if you haven't gotten the Frozen Tablet drop from the Duke, then you are going to be using Icy Basalt to teleport to Weiss, and then run your way through the dungeon. There is a pickaxe available in the room, but higher level pickaxes are faster, so you do just want to bring your best pickaxe that you have. You can 3 tick mine in the room, which would make the iron pick just as fast as like a dragon pick, but it's a lot simpler just to bring the good pick with you. I have a couple of stamina potions, since there's a lot of running while making potions, plus there's a little bit of moving during the fight, so if you run out of run energy, that's not good. We got the Divine Super Combat. The Divine Potion is better than a regular potion, because it keeps your stats fully boosted for 5 minutes instead of slowly draining them. And then at that point, we have the rest of the inventory just being food and prayer stuff. I choose Super Restorers instead of Prayer Potions because you get one more prayer point for each sip on a Super Restore. And I've also got Mana Rays and then a couple Carambuans just in case I need to combo eat. You could bring Ceridome and Brews for even longer trips. I don't really bother with the Brews though because the bank trip is really quick. And you don't take that much damage, especially if you are using the Blood Fury. If you still have any questions about the gear or inventory setup, be sure to let me know in the comments. Now that you're set up for the fight, how do you get there? The Duke is located in the Gorok Dungeon, which is located underneath Weiss, the same dungeon that has the Phantom Muspa. The best teleport is the Ring of Shadows, which you get from completing Desert Treasure 2, but you do have to use the Frozen Tablet on the ring to actually get to the Gorok Dungeon teleport. Uh, if you haven't gotten that good drop from the Duke yet, then you can instead use the Icy Basalt to teleport to Weiss and then walk your way through the dungeon. This is still a pretty quick way to travel there, and you can also set up a portal in your house for Weiss teleports, but it really shouldn't take you too many cases to get that frozen tablet drop. All right, let's talk about how to actually fight the boss. Before you can fight the Duke, you do have to wake him up using poison potions. Uh, you're gonna need to make two of each potion for every fight. To make the potions, you need 12 ardor powder, 12 musca powder, and 12 salic salts. And to get the powders, you can pick mushrooms from either side of the room and then crush them with a pestle and mortar. To get salts, you can mine either salt deposit that is downstairs. Uh, there's a pestle and mortar and an iron pickaxe spawn available on the wall near the entrance. With higher herb lore level, you are gonna get more more powder from each mushroom, and with higher mining, you do get more salt out of the salt deposits. Uh, once you hit 80 mining and 80 herb lore, you'll only need to gather two times from each resource location. 
When you're going for the herbs, you do have to run past the extremities and the walls. These are going to blast like a ray of light that's going to freeze you and hit like a 70 to 80 damage. They are very easy to dodge though. Uh, I have marked the squares directly in front of the extremities, which is actually telling me what square not to step on. You can use the run trick to step through the lights if you just stand on the square right before the dangerous one, and then just go ahead and run all the way across and you won't get hit by any of the lights. Now, there are some other magic attacks that are scattered throughout the path though, and you do have to deal with those by actually like reacting to them, but you can see the shadow up here on the ground when the magic attack is about to happen, giving you a little bit of time to just not run to it. It is worth noting that when you grab a mushroom from the resource location, you can three tick the process by turning the mushroom into powder and then clicking back on the resource location immediately after. It's gonna make your character pick a mushroom a little bit faster, plus you're grinding them down while you're picking them. It shaves a few seconds off of the potion run, but it's really not a necessary thing. When you get the salts, you will have to walk past those poison vents. They go off periodically and they always go off in the same order. So like each row, the next one to go off will always be the one to the right. They're always just slowly moving to the right. So basically you enter the room, drop off a few food, like five of them. So you can grab a pestle and mortar and potentially a pickaxe, then go collect mushrooms. You get 12 of each type of powder and then go ahead and mine 12 salts. Take all of those back to these vats at the beginning of the room and make two poison potions and then go ahead and use the poison potions on the Duke to wake him up. You do have to do this process every kill, and the potion phase does count towards your fight timer. So if you kill the duke in two minutes, that probably was about a minute of potions and a minute of fighting. At first, this is one of the most annoying parts of any of the Desert Treasure 2 bosses. To be honest, the more you do it, the more you get used to it. The fact that you can go through the potions pretty quickly. And also, the fight is balanced so that the potion portion of it is part of the fight. If they had taken the potions away, then fighting the duke, like he would actually have a little bit more health to make the fight about as long. And basically what they did here was turning half the fight into a potion phase instead you can take zero damage while making potions so you're actually using less supplies by getting to do this potion phase once the fight actually begins the duke does have two regular attacks if you're standing outside of melee range from the duke he will use a magic attack the magic attack decides how much damage it does when it lands on the player not when the attack is first used which means that you only have to protect from magic when the projectile actually hits you giving you a chance to react to it the goal is to just stand not far from duke though so that it doesn't use any magic attacks. If you're standing close to the duke when he attacks, he's going to raise his arms up and slam the ground. He will do some damage when he raises his arm. If you protect from melee, it will reduce that damage, but there's still a little bit of chip damage in there. And when he slams them down, it will shatter the icicles that he had spawned there, which does a lot of damage if you were standing on them. Protect from melee does reduce the damage from the icicles, but really you should just be stepping out of the way instead. So most of the fight is just flinching the boss. You want to stand up close when he starts his melee attack and then step out of the way before the icicles go. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you're standing like in a diagonal spot from him, it still counts as being within melee range and he won't put any icicles on this one spot behind the pillar. So you don't necessarily have to have perfect timing with the flinching. You just got to make sure you're not standing right next to him when he slams the ground. For most of the fight, the Duke is attacking at a five tick pace, which is why it is convenient to use a five tick weapon here. So if you're using the arc light, you're probably going to slow your attacks down occasionally while you're trying to run out of the way, but the arc light still can get the full kill. After every five attacks, the Duke uses a freeze attack. He's going to open up his big eye and, and it's going to show this eye overlay on the screen. All you have to do is step behind the pillar when that happens. If you don't step behind the pillar before he attacks, he's going to hit you with a freeze spell that can do up to 90 damage. That's another reason why it's good to flinch near the pillars instead of standing in the middle of the arena. If you're close to the pillar, you have plenty of time to dodge this. Once the Duke uses at least one of those eye gazing attacks, uh, then every three auto attacks, which would be his magic or his melee attack, he's going to shoot out a poison flame at the vent closest to you, which will turn that vent on and force you to run over to the other side of the arena. Once you get the Duke to half health, he will begin to shoot these flares more often and he'll hit two vents instead of one. So when he tosses the canisters out, you don't want to run all the way to the other side too quick, or you might accidentally get some poison canisters on both of the pillars that you have to hide behind. Overall, this attack is also pretty easy to dodge, though. Once you get the Duke down to 25% health, he's going to go into an enraged phase. He will now attack at a 4 tick pace instead of 5, which means it's actually kind of nice to switch over to that arc light if you brought it with you. He uses special attacks a little bit more often, but the fight doesn't really change at all during the enraged phase. You're still just flinching his regular attacks, hiding behind the pillar when you see the eye, and running across to the other side when he uses those poison canisters. That's pretty much it. He does not have a lot of health either, so the fight is not very long, which is part of the reason you have to deal with those potions at first. Now that we've talked about the mechanics for the fight, let's go over a full example kill. 
So as soon as I get in the room, I go ahead and drop off five manta rays and grab the pestle and mortar from here. If you don't have a pickaxe, there is a pickaxe on that wall there. I want to run up to the square before the one that I have highlighted here. I just have the, the first square right in front of the eye highlighted. And from here, you can just run all the way through. As long as you have run energy, you'll get safely through, other than the fact that you might hit some of those magic attacks so real quick if you do let's go ahead and stop picking for a second you imagine if i just got hit by that if i do grind this up and immediately click again you see that i immediately get another mushroom that's how you would uh three tick the mushrooms to get it a little bit faster let's go ahead and run back through make sure we dodge all of these magic attacks i saved the one mushroom here i haven't grinded it up yet on purpose we're gonna go stand up next to the square and send it we got nothing in the way so we're ready to get up to it i am gonna grind and click grind and click try to get through that a little quicker i'm gonna stop short here because i'm kind of scared of that i think i was getting through it anyway but better safe than sorry for the most part uh we get up here and pay attention to where the vents were at uh this one is gonna go on in a sec oops don't run over there yet i did grind up the uh mushroom while i did that to try to be a little bit faster in the mining life but overall the dragon pick is pretty quick now we got 12 of each thing we'll go ahead and use each vat to make two potions and we're just about ready uh, I'm going to sip up on this super combat and put on a bandos god sword prayers on go ahead and spawn a thrall too. start using some potions before this gas vent spawns on me rip a spec very nice Gonna go ahead and one spec and just have at it. I should be on slash. Oops. Don't forget to put your Osmumpton's Fang on slash. And we flinch. Right now I'm attacking pretty close to when he is. But overall, it's it really doesn't matter too much. You don't have to have like perfect timing. We had the first eye attack coming in hot. And squeeze an attack there. And a couple of auto attacks. We will have the poison canisters. Where are they at? That looks like it to me. Should just be one because he's above half health. Let's go and run all the way across and then start doing it again. And we'll get that eye attack soon. Our she blows. Let's go ahead and be careful, dude. And we're good to go. We're going to get another poison canister soon. And this time it's definitely two of them because he is under half health. I'm going to sneak an attack in before we get behind the pillar. I do have my thrall despawning soon, so we're just going to spawn another one now. And he is pretty low health, so I'm actually going to switch to the arc light. Probably gone, should have gone a little faster on that. Since so he's going at a four tick pace, it's a little easier using the arc light now. Just swipe one attack in there quickly. And then just one attack, step back. One attack, step back. And we are done. Go ahead and put on the light bearer. Pick up some of my supplies here. Very nice. Pretty full inventory, honestly. I'm going to drop a couple of food off and then just start heading down the path. Now the timer doesn't start right away. You can see when these guys open up their eyes and they get started, but um, in general, if you like run right away, you can get all the way up to the mushroom before that timer starts, before the fight actually begins. And we start doing it again. If you still have any questions about how the fight works at all, be sure to let me know in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Also, if you would like to see more example kills, I do have two different full hour of Duke videos uploaded that should be linked in the description. Now let's finally go over the loot that you can get from the Duke fight. First of all, let's talk about the perfect kill. If you get a perfect kill on the Duke, you get an extra 50% bonus loot on regular drops. This does not affect your chance at a unique or how many uniques that you get. This is only for the normal drop table. To get a perfect kill, you have to avoid all avoidable damage. So don't get hit by any magic attack from the extremities while you're making potions, and don't get hit by those poison vents while making potions or during the fight. You can't let the Duke use a magic attack at all. Even if you protect from magic to reduce the damage, it'll already ruin the perfect kill if you let him use any. Taking chip damage from the melee attack is fine, but if you take the uh, crystals that come up from the ground, then that will make you lose the perfect kill. And then finally, don't get hit by that big freeze attack. You don't have to get perfect kills at Duke to still get the big unique, but a 50% boost in regular loot is a nice bonus. Speaking of uniques, each kill you have a 1 in 90 chance to hit the unique drop table where you then roll between these drops, but we're going to come back to that in just a second. If you don't get that 1 in 90 roll, you then have a 1 in 48 chance to get an Awakener's Orb. If you don't hit that, you then have a 1 in 25 for the Frozen Tablet, which you can only get once. So if you already have that good Ring of Shadow Teleport, you won't roll for that Frozen Tablet anymore. 
After that, if you didn't get it, you'll roll a 1 in 200 for the Ice Quartz, and if you don't get that, you'll have a 1 in 5 chance for a Supply Drop, which would be the Pineapple Pizzas, Prayer Potion, and Super Combat that he drops occasionally. And then if you don't land any of those rolls, that's when you just get some regular loot, and if you get the perfect kill in that regular loot, you get the plus 50%. So when you hit the Unique Table, which is a 1 in 90 chance, there's a few drops that you can get. You have a 3 out of 8 chance for a Chromium Ingot, a 3 out of 8 chance for a Mage's Vestige, a 1 out of 8 chance for the Eye of Duke, which is the Axe piece, and then a 1 out of 8 chance for a random piece of Virtus. The Mage's Vestige is a little bit strange. You do have to land the drop three times before you actually get one. Basically, you need three pieces of the Vestige, but the first two pieces are invisible, so they won't take up any bank space, but you also won't know if you're 0 out of 3, 1 out of 3, or 2 out of 3 on them. This means that the Mage's Vestige is about as rare as an Axe piece or a random piece of Virtus. Your kills per hour can vary for a few reasons, like your stats, your gear, and just how good you are at the fight, of course. So early on, your KC is likely to be slower since you'll be learning the boss. Up to 25 kills an hour is a reasonable max pace to be looking at. You can definitely push closer to like 30 if you're making no mistakes and rocking max gear, but it's not as easy to accomplish that consistently. With low stats and gear, you're going to reach more like 10 to 15 kills an hour, especially if you find yourself dying often or having to bank a lot because you're using too much food. The OSRS Wiki actually has a nice table to show the average loot that you can get from the Duke, which you can find on the Duke's main page. This table will be updated on the wiki, which makes it easier for you to plug in updated numbers if you're watching this guide many months down the road. Getting the Eye of Duke will only get you more profit if you happen to finish the full Soul Reaper's Axe, which requires fighting all of the Desert Treasure 2 bosses, so just for profiting from Duke, we're going to be ignoring the Eye. When including the Mage's Vestige, you can average anywhere from 206k to 230k per kill at the moment, depending if you get that perfect kill or not. At 10 to 25 KC, that would be 2 mil to 5.7 mil GP an hour in loot, so more like 1.5 to maybe 5 mil profit per hour on average. Of course, that is just an average, though. Most hours you're not going to get the 1 mil plus profit until you actually get the Mage's Vestige, which is a very solid payday. The Duke also has a very cute pet drop. At a 1 in 2500 drop rate, you can get the Baron. The Baron may not be the prettiest pet, but we love him. Good luck out there, pet hunters. I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about when it comes to fighting the Duke. Everyone, if you still have any questions about the guide, be sure to leave them in the comments, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. If you've been enjoying the videos lately, or you're just getting some useful information out of them, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. I also stream on Twitch, which should be linked on the screen and in the description. Thank you for watching my Duke guide, everyone, and best of luck on your Duke grinds.